Okay. Well, again, my name is Mickey Ransom. Sorry for the slow start here. Um, I'm head of the department and I'd like to talk to you today about uh, doing a state of the department presentation, just to show you where we are and where we're going. Now it won't advance for me. What do I do to advance it? Brian, you guys the screen with the presentation and then it should allow you to click on the second one. Which one? Just click right on the presentation and then see if it lets you do it. There we go. Okay. Um, to kind of let you know what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to start out by giving you a department overview. Uh, we'll do a discussion about uh, teaching extension and research during the pandemic. Talk to you a little bit about social media, give you an update on some faculty staff changes. Uh, we'll kind of go over who some of the award winners are for this year. And then we'll talk about some future plans and challenges for the future. And then I'll close out by answering your questions. So let's go over what some of the resources are we have in the department. Uh, talking about people first, because honestly, those are the, the, the most important thing that we have in the department would be the people who work in the department. But we have 36 tenured or tenure track faculty. And then we have nine non tenure track faculty that would either be research assistant professors or uh, uh, some sort of professional agronomist. Then we have 24 adjunct faculty. Uh, the number of total staff members would be a little elusive depending on how you count them. But let's say we have about 90 which would include uh, USS employees unclassified as well as some postdocs. The current count on our graduate students, we have 78. And then as far as agronomy majors go, we have 102 majors and about 20 minors. Uh, the budget is a big one. We have a total budget of 16.25 million. And these budget numbers are from FY19 because we're always running a year behind when we, uh, when we need to give you the budget numbers. The budget numbers for FY20 are not actually available yet. Now, if you break that down, we have about 7 million in what's referred to as a general use budget. That would include the state and federal allocations. Then we have 7.6 million in awards and grants, and I'll break that down for you in a few minutes. And then we have around 1.6 million that would be in some category other. Those would dominantly be uh, gifts, foundation, and that sort of thing. As far as facilities go, we have close to 80,000 square feet in Throckmorton. We have a total of 135 greenhouse modules, uh, giving us over 1,000 square feet of greenhouse space. We have about a thousand acres at the North Agronomy Farm and that Ash and also at Ashland Bottoms about 16 miles uh, uh, southwest of Manhattan. We have 3300 acres at the Reynolds Flint Hills Prairie that's uh, south of Manhattan on the uh, K177. And then we have a one about a 100 uh, about a thousand acres at our experiment fields at Ottawa, Hutchinson, Belleville, Scandia, Rossville, and Silver Lake. So we have a lot of facilities. Now let me talk a little bit about the budget overall. And in my opinion, the overall state budget situation is improving. And uh, for about the past three or four years, the federal budget has been pretty stable as far as the funds that we get from federal sources. Now we did have a challenge um, uh, that came up this past July associated with some pretty major budget cuts. And these were actually administered in both FY21 and fiscal year 22. 
with approximately a 10% budget cut. Um, and this amounted to a total of $600,000. And then it was specifically broken down into different program areas. 95,000 in teaching, 417,000 in research, and 88,000 in our extension programs. Now the FY21 cuts, those have already been made. And to give you an idea of what we gave up related to that cut, which by the way, that was a majority of the 10% total cut. We lost the faculty position in Precision Ag. We lost a significant portion of our GRA stipends. However, GRAs, you don't need to worry about that because this does not affect any current funding. We uh, lost some of our federal and state operating funds. Uh, some of our teaching, operating, and labor funds were also absorbed in the budget cut. And then finally, we had to backfill some extension staff salaries uh, using some of our other funds that would come from either restricted fees or sponsored research overhead. Now, in next fiscal year that would start next July in fiscal year 22, we're going to lose another $100,000 in GRA stipends, which by the time we take that loss, we still have around $100,000 in GRA stipends, uh, which would give us uh, some flexibility, but in the future, most of our GRA stipends will be covered on grant funds. And then we're also going to lose another flex faculty position that's yet to be determined. And we have a planning and advisory committee that's called the Departmental Committee on Planning and the, that group of faculty members, uh, they were involved in planning for all of our cuts. And then as everyone knows, we have administrative furloughs this year. And if you were to add up the total in the department, that would be about 275,000 in administrative furloughs. So that's a significant chunk too. Talk a little bit about the business staff organization. For the first time in a, over a year, we're now fully staffed, but in my opinion, we're still overworked and underpaid. We do have some adjustments in procedures that are in process of where we're trying to increase our efficiency. And we've recently had a group that's called the Business Architecture Team. They're part of uh, K-State Information Technology and also a few people from some other areas that they they've, have taken a look at our business operations and process. And uh, they've developed some recommendations that we'll be starting to talk soon about how we're going to be, uh, be addressing those but basically they've been looking at uh, accounting, human resources, the way we pay graduate student stipend and fee payments, purchasing, uh, and basically they're kind of using us as a guinea pig. We're one of the first departments that they've done this with, and then they're going to apply some of the findings uh, from our department to other departments as well. We're currently working on a communications plan so we can figure out a way how to communicate this best to our faculty and staff. One thing that uh, there was one statistic that came up that I thought everyone would be interested in in this process. If you were to uh, see how our departmental spending has grown, it's gone from uh, $2 million in FY10 up to $16 million in FY19, and that's without no increase in the size of our business staff. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about teaching here, and you're, you're starting to see that I'm going to be using some slides that uh, sort of show what the life is like, teaching is like, research is like, and so forth. In the during the COVID pandemic, you'll see a lot of people wearing face masks and so forth. But this shows our teaching enrollment trends since 2011 up to this year. You can see that we uh, had a high of around 2015 and 2016, and then we've been slowly decreasing in enrollment since then. 
to currently 102 undergraduates and 78 graduate students. Now to break down our undergraduate enrollment, uh, again, a total of 102 based on the different options. You can see that a majority of our students are in the consulting and the production option with a, a fewer number in the plant science and biotechnology option, precision ag, soil and environmental science, and then the two options with the lowest enrollment would be business and industry and range management. Talk a little bit about the undergraduate experience and uh, this would involve a lot of our teaching and advising programs. Uh, like to mention, we have international opportunities and this slide shows a good illustration of one of the crops judging team uh, going to Australia on their judging trip last fall. Um, this is, uh, I believe this was taken on a beach in Queensland. We also have uh, employment opportunities associated with internship, the Wheat State Agronomy Club. We have undergraduate research experiences. Uh, prior to COVID, we uh, kept our student lounge open that was available for study. And then we have a number of competition teams that I'll be talking about. Continuing on in teaching, uh, the average starting salary is for undergraduate students uh, starting out would be about 46,000 and the high this last time was 65,000. Uh, we were able to take a study abroad uh, tour uh, just before the COVID pandemic hit during uh, spring 2020. And this upper slide is a, a slide from that, a visit to Costa Rica. And then the slide below this shows uh, the internship poster symposium uh, that we held out at the Agronomy Education Center last fall. Talking then about some of our competition teams, I'll do the crops judging team first. Uh, it was certainly another national championship year for them and a complete sweep of individual awards. For example, in, the, the, in fall 2019, they were first in Chicago, first in Kansas City. And then if you were to look at the individual placings in both of those contests, K-State team members took the first, second, and third placing in both contests. Uh, the the uh, NACTA contest in spring 2019 was uh, canceled due to the COVID pandemic, but they did go to two regional contests where they placed first in both of those. And this shows a couple of slides from those two regional contests. The soils judging team, they had planned on competing in the NACTA contest last spring, but that was canceled due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, this fall, they competed in a regional contest and for the first time, at least in our regional history, it was uh, held remotely of where they, uh, they sent soil cores from the contest location that was in, actually in Missouri and they sent it to all of the teams and they looked at and described the cores and filled out their scorecards uh, uh, here in the case of our team here in Manhattan. And so they finished second overall. Katie Frost was the, was the fifth high individual and Jagger Borth was the 10th high individual. Uh, the team coaches uh, for those would be Deanne Presley and Colby Moorberg and Jake Zigafoos also helped with the coaching as a graduate student. Now from the weed science, uh, normally they compete in the North Central Weed, uh, weed Science Contest. Um, the picture that I'm showing you is from July 2019 because the 2020 contest was canceled due to the COVID and that contest has been rescheduled for the summer of 2021 in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, at the 2019 contest, uh, they were first, uh, the undergraduate team, and the under, it, at, at the national level, and the graduate team was first in, in the Western Division part of the contest. 
And in 2019, that team was coached by uh, Dallas Peterson and uh, Anita Dilley. Um, I think the 2021 team will be coached by Sarah Lancaster and Anita Dilley. Okay, the National Forage Bowl competition, uh, that was held in the spring of 2020 uh, in South Carolina at the American Forage and Grassland Council meeting. Uh, this happened right before they had their contest, right before the COVID pandemic hit, but uh, we had the second place finish from that team. Now going on and talking a little bit about some of our graduate student experiences. We try to involve our graduate students so that they also have opportunities uh, to participate in our teaching and extension programs. There's an agronomy graduate student club. There are opportunities for graduate students to do both basic as well as applied research. We try to provide some professional development activities, employment opportunities, and then we have agronomy seminar also available to graduate students. And this shows uh, Jake Zigafoos, who's one of our uh, GTAs teaching uh, the soil judging class. Okay, continuing on with some of the graduate student activities. We have a graduate student orientation in the fall. We try to provide some leadership opportunities, uh, professional meetings, poster presentations, lots of things like that for our graduate students to participate in. Uh, there's a family adoption program that's usually done around Christmas time through the Flint Hills Adopt a Family program that the graduate students uh, run. And then before the COVID pandemic, we were having uh, uh, monthly faculty breakfasts and also some periodic afternoon seminars. And here you can see uh, Dr. C.M. Pitty presenting uh, at one of, with one of his PhD students right at the graduation ceremony from last fall. Okay, we've had to adjust, obviously, during the pandemic. I tried to pick a few slides that showed some of this. Uh, here we have students looking at soil cores. This is one of our students, uh, one of our uh, courses. I think this is crop growth and development taught out at the agronomy farm. Um, the, you see some slides here from the crop science class out at the agronomy farm. Um, and also uh, we have some classes. This is in our regular classroom facility for crop science. Here's Dr. Stu Duncan teaching uh, the Agronomy 360 Crop Growth and Development students about cotton. Moving on to some of our extension activities, uh, I would say that for the most part, you could, could put a lot of our extension activities in these categories, pre precision agriculture, cover crop, soil health, social media, improving profit profitability and developing more efficient crop production. And because of the COVID pandemic, normally the field days that we have during the summer and the fall, virtually all of those were virtual. I did get a, a few slides of some extension activities during the pandemic. Uh, this slide and this slide were were both uh, associated with uh, one of the uh, one of the range field days. Here you have our extension state leader uh, uh, Dorvar Ruiz Diaz, and this presentation was before COVID. It was actually from last fall, and here you see Stu Duncan uh, out again. He's an extension specialist, but it shows how we involve our extension specialists in our teaching program. Here he's teaching crop growth and development out at the North Agronomy Farm. And then this slide was from a, uh, a soil health field, uh, field day that we were able to have in person this summer. Now talking a little bit about the Kansas Mesonet, that would be the, the uh, weather stations that we have scattered across Kansas. 
we have a large number of these and we have two types of stations. We have the more modern stations that have the 30 foot towers. The locations for those are shown with a green box. And then the older 10 foot tripod stations, those are shown with a red circle. So you can see that those are pretty well scattered throughout the state. During 2019-2020, uh, uh, we installed nine new stations. We have provided additional support for water technology. We did a green algae study in cooperation with KU that was uh, associated with uh, some of the mesonet work. We've collaborated with the Army Corps of Engineers and when you have this many weather stations scattered throughout the state, that means you're doing a lot of uh, station visits for maintenance, a total of 226 of those. And I would like to point out that you can look at the weather data at two different websites. This Mesonet uh, site has the live data and this one here, the climate.ksu.edu, uh, this has more of the, uh, the historical weather data and so forth. Now the Kansas Mesonet uh, Extension people, they were involved in more than 75 presentations, 425 data requests, over 26% increase in their web, web traffic. And uh, one thing that we're kind of proud of is our mesonet is actually the first mesonet in the country that's been fully incorporated into the National Fire Danger Rating System. We are working on developing a, a weather event historical archive, and we're soon going to add uh, to the, the web page, the mesonet web, web page, interactive precipitation data. Okay, now moving on to some of our uh, research er uh, area, um, kind of give you a history of what happened. Well, it's, it had a big impact on research. For the most part, the university closed the campus in March and all of our research activities moved to a system that was known as mission critical research. And during this, some labs were actually placed in hibernation other labs remained open, but they had to file a mission critical research plan. We were able to keep up most of our field operations. We continued those as mission critical, but with limitations associated with uh, uh, restrictions on in-state travel and basically no out-of-state travel. I would say we were lucky because some other states like Ohio, they were forced to shut down all of their field operations related to research and extension during the COVID. Now over the summer, we started to ramp back up our plans and we had to develop official plans for these. And we developed a total of 30, 32 individual plans. And some of these are currently still being revised. We've had hiring freezes in place we have an undergraduate hiring freeze exemption that requires the dean's approval. And then for any other hiring freeze exemption, uh, that, that would require both the dean as well as a provost approval. In my opinion, uh, during this mission critical research phase, we were operational at about 50 to 60% of our regular capacity. And then if you were to look at where we are now, I would say we're about 80% operational capacity. Um, we still maintain, we've been able to maintain a lot of our grant activity and, and everything. Uh, in FY19, agronomy submitted 224 uh, research proposals for extramural funding. And of those 103 received awards and the research awards total 7.6 million. Now let me show you how that kind of compares to previous years. And it also compares to how we're doing in relation uh, to, the, to the rest of the College of Agriculture and the university. 
So you can see that our funding has been extramural funding that obtained through grants and contracts and gifts has been pretty stable uh, for the last four years. And then these numbers above each bar graph would show where we, where we rank, where this, the first number is uh, where we ranked uh, in the College of Agriculture. So in FY19, we were second in the College of Agriculture. And then the second number is, is the, our ranking throughout the university uh, based on academic departments. And we were fifth. Uh, to let you know, the university rank during FY19, geology was first, diagnostic medicine and uh, pathobiology was second, plant pathology third, physics fourth, and agronomy was fifth, and we did pass biology in extramural funding in FY19. Show some of our research activities during the pandemic, and one thing a lot of us uh, had to learn in a hurry would be how to operate from home, how to run your research operation, your teaching operation, whatever you're doing from home. And uh, this, this shows my home office. I'm being Zoom bombed here by our two cats. Uh, this is Deanne Presley's home office, for example. And we all had to, had to make adjustments. Like here you, you see a uh, uh, couple of our researchers uh, uh, doing harvesting on grain sorghum, wearing masks. And then uh, when the, uh, for example, uh, Chip uh, Redman, when he would go out and do some of the maintenance on the weather stations for the Kansas Mesonet, he was actually doing a lot of camping. Uh, to try to avoid staying in a hotel during the COVID. All right, now let me uh, review with you a little bit about our social media activities. Talk about our Twitter, our Twitter account first. Um, that would be at K-State Agron. Uh, and we target each one of these social media operations to a particular audience. So our audience for Twitter would be producers, agents, and consultants. And we've, we have uh, almost 7,700 followers. That number is up from last year. And impressions is one way that you can, you can count your activity. Uh, this is a good number of impressions. And you might be curious what the high would be, uh, 124,000 uh, year. 124,000 during April, and then the lower number of impressions during February. And then what works on Twitter, what we've typically found is that mentions by agronomy faculty, agronomy researchers, those are very important. Hashtags are critical. And then we're, we're very selective in the way we do our, our retweeting. That's also important. And then anytime we can highlight accomplishments of students, faculty, and alumni, that's also very good on, on helping our Twitter audience. Our top tweet dealt with uh, drought stress uh, taking a toll on wheat across the state. And uh, this was uh, one of Romulo, Romulo Lolato's tweet. Now we also have Instagram and Facebook accounts. This shows the number of followers we have on Instagram. Again, our number is up compared to 2019 and our targeted audience for Instagram would be student and extension activities and department accomplishments. Facebook, uh, our number of likes, number of followers up from last year. Our targeted audience for Facebook would be student faculty recognition, student and extension activities, agronomic promotional and informational videos. And then we carefully do some e-updates, uh, KSRE and external articles using Facebook. Now we're starting a new YouTube account 
and I'd like to mention this because currently we only have 149 subscribers, so spread the word, we need to increase this. But what we're targeting for, uh, uh, for the, the YouTube account would be streaming line of live events, highlighting student and or uh, research projects, timely agronomy projects. We've added seven new videos this fall semester. And then if you have current questions or ideas about YouTube, please direct those to Kathy Gill. Little bit about our extension agronomy e-update. We have a new address for that. It uh, has a different format compared to what it uh, had in previous years. We have almost 1,500 email uh, subscribers, so there's a lot of following of these agronomy e-updates. And we're also planning uh, new features to be added in the future. And this is just a, a real quick overlook, overlook about what, what one of our agronomy e-updates uh, might look like. We did have some losses that I would like to talk about those. So in memory, there were a couple of people that I actually should have mentioned last year uh, in my, when I did this uh, presentation and I failed to cover them. So I'll mention that this year. Uh, Dale Nes Nelson, who passed away uh, March, 2019. He was an agricultural technician in the crop performance program. And then Dr. Bill Hare, passed away in April 19. He was an agronomist in charge and associate professor at the South Central Experiment Field. Here's a picture of Bill. And then from this year, we've lost uh, Richard Vangman, plant science technician at the Kansas River Valley Experiment Field. Bill Eberly, here's a picture of Bill. He was associate professor and extension specialist in land use management. Clarence Swallow uh, passed away last October, but uh, this he he passed away after I gave my uh, state of the department address uh, last fall. He was a professor and superintendent of the agronomy research farm, and that's a picture of Clarence. We've had some faculty staff changes, new faculty hires. Sarah Lancaster, Extension Weed Management. Scott Dooley, North Central Experiment Field, Assistant Agronomist. Two new hires in the Agronomy Office. Emma McElhaney Parsley, New Office Specialist. Stephanie Freeman, she's uh, new in the Accountant One position. We've also had some departures, retirements. Uh, Jeff Morris left as an Associate Professor in Sorghum Genetics to take another position at Colorado State. Zach Stewart left as research assistant professor uh, to go to work for uh, FAO, but he'll continue to live in Manhattan, so we'll still see Zach around quite a bit. Gary Harder left uh, the department as a longtime assistant scientist out at the North, North Farm and at Ashland. And then Nash, Nancy Williams recently retired last summer as an office specialist. I'd like to mention our agronomy leadership team. I'm department head, Anita Dilley is assistant head for teaching. Dorvar Ruiz Diaz is the extension state leader for agronomy. And then Gerard Klutenberg is our graduate program director. To, uh, to go over, uh, I call this just another day in agronomy, but these are some of our faculty award winners uh, from uh, 2019 and 2020. Now the award winners from the Crop Science Society of America, American Society of Agronomy, and the Soil Science Society of America, these are all the 2019 winners. The 2020 winners I think are known, but they've actually not been published yet, so we'll hit those last year. So these are all of our award winners um, uh, from 2019. And I'm not going to read through every one of these, but you can see that we're very well represented 
with a lot of national, international awards and some very important uh, uh, positions like uh, Var Prasad, Crop Science Society of America president. Now these are the uh, some of the award winners and officers of the Weed Science Society of America. Anita Dilly, I think she's actually currently serving as president. She's moved up from vice president to president. Uh, Vipin Kumar has held some leadership positions. Uh, Mithila Jugulam uh, has uh, had a, a very uh, distinguished achievement award in research from the North Central Weed Science Society. And then Walt Fick was uh, named as a fellow of the Society of Range Management. And then moving on to, to some other different types of awards. Uh, Mary Gatteri, a Gene Stewardship Award from the uh, Borlaug Global Rust Initiative. Du Hong Min, an outstanding paper award from uh, uh, in crop science for forages and grasslands. Uh, Krishna Jagadish, associate editor of Field Crops Research. Colby Moorberg, NACTA Educator Award. Uh, Chip Redmond serves on the National Mesonet Advisory Board. And then Chuck Rice has a couple here of very distinguished awards as well, including uh, Educator of the Year Award of the Mid-America Crop Life Association. More faculty awards. Jean Steiner, um, she's an, ad, uh, an adjunct professor in our department. She received the Hugh Hammond Bennett Award of, of the Soil and Water Conservation Society and that's their most prestigious award. Sarah Sexton Bowser, distinguished young alumni uh, of the K-State Alumni Association. Clinton Owensby, distinguished alumnus award of New Mexico State University. Craig Rosaboom, College of Agriculture faculty of the semester. Ganga Hederachi, fluid fertilizer uh, forum, outstanding researcher of the year award. Ignacio C.M. Pitti, uh, Gamma Sigma Delta, Outstanding Research Awards. So a lot of other uh, important faculty awards here. Now moving on to some of our undergraduate student awards. Uh, these would be from the uh, uh, last year's uh, SAS ES meeting in San Antonio. Uh, Noah Winans was a Golden Opportunity Scholar from last year. And then Abigail Cortacrax will be the Golden Opportunity Scholar for this year. And I won't read over all of these, but this shows some of the important placings of our undergraduate students uh, at the national meetings. Now going on then to undergraduate student recognition. Um, we have a, quite a number of these and uh, I probably won't read each individual name as I go through these other than you can just see that we've got a very wide distribution showing a lot of accomplishments by our graduate students. And this list here, these are all from the ASA Crop Science Society of America and Soil Science Society of America awards from the 2019 meetings. All right, the employees of the year from the university support staff. Um, this has not actually been announced yet, but the, so this is the, the We'll be presenting this award later on, but Charlie Clark, uh, Ag Technician 2, Kansas River Valley, is receiving the Departmental University Support Staff Employee of the Year Award. And then we're in the final stages of selecting the Unclassified Professional Employee of the Year Award. These will be announced at the uh, uh, KSRE uh, conference later on this fall. Now looking to the future, I wanted to, uh, to mention that we have a new department head coming. 
Dr. Raj Kosla will be arriving in January. He's currently the Robert Gardner Award Professor at Colorado State. He has a research teaching and extension appointment in precision agriculture. Um, he's internationally known in precision agriculture and has had a very distinguished career. As you can see, he's a quite young looking fellow and it's going to be interesting to see how long he will keep his hair color as a department head and how quickly it may change to gray like mine. But uh, we're really looking forward to Raj joining our department and I know that all of you are going to be exciting to excited to have him. He's very enthusiastic and uh, he's just going to be an outstanding department head. Now there will be a uh, kind of a transition period. He'll officially be department head, but I'm going to remain on the faculty for about three months. I'll be helping him during this transition period and we'll actually do our year end evaluations in sort of a joint effort. And then my plans are to retire about April the 1st um, of uh, 2021. Now talking a little bit about future challenges, in my opinion, we're in the midst of what I'm calling a double whammy that's associated with these budget reductions. But we're actually seeing some of our budget reductions associated with the implementation of the new budget model, but it's also we're, we're having budget challenges that's because of the COVID pandemic, which is also associated with in, uh, enrollment management. Uh, so uh, we're, the university is involved in a strategic enrollment management plan, uh, the implement, implementation of that, and that has been a challenge in itself during the COVID pandemic. My analysis would be that we would be continuing in phase three and that we're definitely planning to have blended classes during spring 2021. There is going to be a new strategic plan initiative that will start during the summer of 2021. And we're also in the future, and this is not just next year, it's going to be the year after that and the year after that, but we're going to be dealing with some building infrastructure issues uh, related to uh, building maintenance and old buildings throughout the College of Ag, K-State Research and Extension. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we have a few minutes here for questions. Does anyone have a question? And if you have a question, you can just say it or you can put it in the chat. Either one works for me. And I see Craig Rosenboom already has a statement in here that I think is so true during the COVID. It's not as easy as we all make it look every day. I totally agree with that, Craig. It's been a challenge. Oh, I see, that was in reference to issues with my Zoom. <laughs> that also shows you that I've not been teaching during the Zoom. Which those of you that know me know that uh, I'm a teacher at heart. So it's, it's been tough for me not to be involved in the teaching program. Well, Craig, I would say your statement also applies to just everyday life during COVID. Looks like we've had good participation. We currently have 62 participants. 
Again, questions? Questions about the department? Where you think we may be going? Just questions in general. Hey, Mickey. Uh, yes, sir. Go Nathan. ahead, Nathan. Hey, thanks for that uh, uh, good presentation and overview of the department. And um, I've got a question I'm not sure um, if you'll be able to answer it, but I, I'm going to kind of throw it out there anyway. Um, I like those. Okay. So you showed that graph that show we, we rank pretty high relative to grant expenditures uh, relative to other departments on campus. Um, and, and so it shows we we're bringing in a fair amount of, of money there. Uh, for grants, how does that compare to how we are going to rank as far as budget from the university with the new budget model? And and second, kind of a follow-up to that, how does that rank compare to our ability to support our infrastructure? So. If we're ranking at the top of, of our grant dollars coming in, do you feel that we are all that we also rank at the top in um, in uh, in our ability to support farms, equipment, all all the stuff that goes along with the research? Are we ranking high there as well? You think so? Kind of both budget related questions. Okay, that, that's a very good question. And let me start out uh, by saying that the uh, grant dollars, the grant support, that's not included in the new budget model. It, it does not factor in the new budget model. Uh, dominantly, the new budget model is based on, uh, on uh, teaching, uh, student credit hours generated. There's a higher weight given for graduate classes uh, but it's a rather complicated in some ways, but in other ways, it's a quite simple formula. Now, the grant dollars are going to be very important to us in the future because as our operating dollars shrink, and I think we can probably expect that there will be some continued shrinking of those, we're going to be depending more and more on grant dollars for support. Let me give you an example. Uh, we've essentially lost $200,000 most recently in the budget cuts uh, from our uh, funds that were used to support GRA stipends. So basically in the future, most of our GRAs will, will be on grant dollars. Um, um, and so that's just one example. Uh, it's going to be very critical that we maintain uh, the edge that we have in our ability to obtain extramural support. Okay, uh, I see. Maybe I should ask Nathan if you want to follow up before I try it. I'll move to some of these others. Um, I guess, you know, the one, the one question, I know you say that grant dollars do, don't follow in with, you know, don't calculate into the new budget model, but I guess I'm still curious, where do we stand relative to other departments or entities in the university relative to what we're going to be getting from the university in the budget model? Oh. And, and, and then along these, you know, well, why don't you go with that, and then I won't, I won't, I won't keep asking multiple questions. I'll let you answer one at a time. Yeah, uh, I actually don't have the answer to that because I can tell you in general terms uh, that the College of Agriculture uh, has not fared real well under the new budget model, and it's related to the the, the way uh, the new budget model uh, goes and the way the calculations are made. And I think if you look at other land grant universities across the country that have shifted to this new uh, RCM type of a budget model, 
um, land grant, uh, the land grant component, the College of Agriculture or whatever it's called, as well as the experiment station and the extension service associated with that, uh, they don't do very well under these this type of a new budget model. Okay, thanks. And then and then a follow up. So you had you had said. So it seems like our our money coming in from the university is going to go down, and our grant expenditures are going up. And you said that we're going to have to look at ways to use grant dollars to pay for things that we used to um, use state support for uh do you have any and, and you mentioned graduate students are one and that's an easy one because i'm guessing even before we lost the gra stipend still most of our graduate students that's are correct grants. so yeah, that's, i'm glad you mentioned that i really meant to mention that but most of our graduate students have always been on grant support yeah. so so that seems to me not to devalue graduate students but it's something that is already built into our grant system that's easy to cover graduate students off of grants. But what about the other uh, components of our department that we're going to lose or we are losing state support for? How can we potentially uh, use grant dollars to support those vital positions of the department? Well, I wish I had an easy answer for that, but I don't. I think it's going to be a challenge and I think we just need to recognize that that's what it is. Uh, we still, we've had losses in our operating support. We had still have some operating support left, uh, but I, honestly, I think we cut it down about as much as we possibly can and we better hope we don't have any future budget cuts coming up. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. I, I think that, I think that we need to figure this out, because um, I'm going to bet that there are future budget cuts, um, because like every year for the past 12 years there have been. Almost. So, I think that's a really tough thing that we've got to figure out how to. Uh, get more of the funding in our department to you know to use more of the grant dollars to fund some of these essential components of our department which are probably there mainly to support the research mission and so we've got large portions of our department that support the research um and we, and we probably need to figure out how to get financial support behind those aspects of our department from the research dollars Okay, uh, moving on to some other questions. Someone asked me a real easy one. This is a softball question, so I'll, I'll answer it next. What are my uh, plans after retirement? Well, my wife, Nora, and I, we love living in Manhattan, and we would like to stay in Manhattan, but we don't have any close relatives here. Uh, our daughter lives in Spokane, Washington, uh, along with her husband and three granddaughters. So very likely uh, we'll be selling our house here in Manhattan and moving to Spokane, Washington after I retire. Um, another question here is it talked about the increase from uh, 2 million to 16 million. How can we not afford more accounting staff? Well, that's largely a, a growth due to increase in grant support. And the grant support is directly targeted to other things. And the only way we could afford to hire some uh, additional accounting support would be if we use some of the sponsored research that comes off that grant support. And we have been gradually shifting uh, more of our, uh, some of our employees to where they're partially funded on sponsored research overhead. Mickey, I can't resist asking. If Go ahead, if, Richard. If 50% of the department's budget is grants and contracts, I asked this of our previous president, why can't we get rid of 50% of the rules on those? 
<laughs> well, I wish my, it worked that my, way, Richard. My estimation was that when COVID came in, the university decided that they could overrule anything that the grant said. Well, a lot of the grants have their own rules, and that's actually one of the problems because you have to keep up with the different rules for from each granting agency. So some of these rules that we fight with are not necessarily university rules. They're rules uh, that the university is trying to follow because they believe that's what has to be done because of the granting agency. Well, but I think in many cases it was because the two sets of rules didn't agree. That may be sometimes too. I don't have a solution. It just seems to yeah. me that I don't. I don't think the the rules have gotten any better in the university in the last seventeen years. All Thanks right. If I, if, Ransom, if I could ask a question. Sure, a general, go ahead, general, Mark. More of a general question. Uh, certainly the new RCM model is penalizing the research because those, the research dollars which, which we generate is not coming back to the department. So have there been any discussions of changing the SRO model uh, so that the departments will get a little bit more percentage of that grants generated so that we can complement or supplement some of the losses with the new RCM model? Right, uh, that's an excellent question, Vara. And you know, if if I had to make a prediction, my prediction would be if any adjustments are made, it will go the opposite way, such that the department and the individual researcher will actually get less of a cutback on the sponsored research overhead, and more of it will be held centrally by the university. I'm afraid that's the trend that we might be headed for. And uh, uh, I think part of this depends on everyone needs to pay close attention to the uh, search that will be starting for the new uh, vice, uh, vice president for mm -hmm. research, because whoever ends up in that position will have a large uh, 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 ability to decide what it would be the future on the sponsored research overhead. Currently, there's a formula that is fairly favorable for departments and individual researchers getting a cut of that. Uh, you know, and they can put it right back into their research program. But at other, there are other universities that that formula is not as favorable for the department and for the individual researcher. I'll just mention in that, that sense, I think we are into a triple whammy, not double whammy. That would be a triple <laughs> whammy. You're exactly correct. <laughs> just, just to follow up, I was on faculty center a couple of years ago and that uh, VP of research was heading exactly in that direction, but was told to hold off a little bit as, or told to hold off as the new budget model came online. And so there's some momentum behind that movement already, I believe. Uh, I totally agree with you, Craig. And I think we were headed in that direction and then the COVID situation hit. And now we need to see what the new uh, uh, vice uh, president for research will do related to that. Let's see, Chuck Rice has a question. How do we be more proactive in getting large grants, especially with a trend for transdisciplinary research and industry partnerships? Um, I wish I had an easy answer for that, Chuck. I don't, but I certainly agree with you that we definitely need to be proactive in getting large grants. Our department has been very successful in getting large grants uh, that are transdisciplinary, uh, but certainly anything we can do that would increase that uh, activity, we're going to need to be doing it in the future. And I think that is the trend in funding agencies and it's what we'll need to be doing 
is going after these large grants. So we need to make sure that we're competitive. We need to make sure that we're, we have all of the disciplines covered so that we are able to compete for these large grants and many of them will cut, be cutting across disciplines. I'll add, Mickey, that as I talk to other individuals on different committees I'm on, um, they're relying more or diversifying their portfolio. So they're looking at NGOs uh, and as well as industry and in getting uh, more diversified portfolios. So they aren't, aren't depending on federal grants uh, as much or expanding the pool, I guess looking at um, foundations, nature, you know, nature conservancy, um, as well as uh, industry. Now, as far as the industry partnerships go, there's a group that meets once a month uh, that works on uh, trying to develop uh, improved industry partnerships. Uh, that meeting was called and headed up by the Peter Dorhout. And so it will also be interesting to see if his new replacement will be working in that regard as well. Are there other questions? Yeah, as Vara makes an interesting comment here is sometimes as we do get large grants, the faculty are moved to the central administration. This is, there's a history of this, that's correct. Are there other questions? Either in the chat or just say it. 